essentially what we did was we tried to empower people to eliminate corruption. The whole, the whole idea of corruption, right, I mean, uh, the way it works is when you see an act of corruption, you tweet, you SMS, or you, you know, email it, and you'll map it immediately. So you're using the same platform that was used by um, the Tunisian uh, revolution, which we toppled the government and the Egyptian uh, guys. The whole, the whole motivation for this is that, as you know in the act of corruption, the person who pays the bribe normally don't want to report it because they get whatever they want, right? The guy who got the money obviously doesn't say anything. But think about places like in India, where if you cannot afford to pay a bribe, and you need to pay a bribe to get a driving license so you can actually move up in the social chain, you can't. So what happens to them? They get caught, right? They get stuck. So we want to give them a voice. And that was the whole motivation for this project. Um, so anyway, to cut a long story short, we gave this project away to Transparency International. It got too dangerous. I, uh, I was, was uh, asked by one American guy, like, why should we Americans give a, you know, give a hood about, uh, uh, you know, about, about corruption in, in Africa or in India? Who cares, right? We're not, we're yet, right? We don't give a shit. So anyway, I told them, like, 80% of uh, earthquake deaths, like in Haiti, were caused by corruption. And you could be staying in a hotel in a more a third world country where the building inspector has been bribed, you know, with kids, and your building collapsed. Or the one in China, where the uh, high-speed train in, you know, in Wenzhou, where I think uh, 120 people died, and the government started paying out $40,000 to everybody before the bodies were even taken out. But this was a big mistake, because um, people who travel on high-speed train in China are not your normal day-to-day -day Chinese. These are the high net worth Chinese, and 40 grand is nothing to them too, but they have, might only have one kid. And this is a real issue, and the government almost talked, you know, basically the Ministry of Rio had to resign. So I mentioned it in my talk, and then somebody posted my Facebook link, Clarence, be careful. You know, and it was linked to a news piece from a Chinese paper that said that a Chinese anti-corruption official was found stabbed 10 times, and the court ruled it as suicide. So I thought, yeah, it's not a very good idea working in this project. Anyway, um, so we gave it to Transparency International as the other release of my year. It was a project called Matanet. Um, they wanted to, you know, we thought it was a silly idea. So they said they want to make, they want to make, um, you know, uh, flying drones Flying craft or flying drones for uh, for the third world. Right. Yeah, it's a pretty silly idea, but it was actually an amazing idea. It's, a, it's called Matanet as opposed to Ethernet. It's a Pony Express to deliver medicine and goods to the third world country where there are no roads. So it will it will fly two miles and maybe carry 10, 20 pounds, and then it will then transfer the goods to the next drone that will fly off and deliver the medication and so forth. So they tried it out in Haiti and it, it, it uh, had pretty good results. This one really inspired me. This, uh, this is a product called Medic Transition. Uh, this was in 2012. Um, an Indonesian girl, sponsored by my friends, uh, who went to Singularity, uh, uh, who hosted a uh, competition in Indonesia. She won and she went to Singularity and worked with these two integrated guys. And in three weeks, developed this blur that allowed women to check their own breasts for lumps. Because if you think about it, right, how are you going to bring a breast cleaning clinic to a place where there's no power and no roads? So this one, this glove has sensors in it. So essentially, the data is logged onto an SD card, which then can go onto a place where you can upload the data, and essentially then- And this guy, Rob Reinhardt, he's now a multi-millionaire, but uh, when I met him, he uh, was just having his Kickstarter project. He created Soylent. Have you guys heard of Soylent? So about a year and a half ago, he published on the web, and talked about how you know he got tired of the drudgery of cooking and eating and going out to eat. So he, created, he went out and found out what humans need, what kind of nutrients you need to survive. He went out and bought all the chemicals <coughs> and mixed it all up into a drink called Soylent and he just drank it and for a month. He said he was healthier, he saved a lot of time, he didn't have to cook, he didn't have to go. He only missed the social part of eating. Anyway, when I met him at, uh, at, at one of the functions at Singularity, I asked him about this and he said, oh, you know, the real reason why was because, you know, I had a startup and I didn't have enough money to actually go buy a burger at McDonald's because the minimum meal at McDonald's was four dollars. And he wanted to bring down the cost of uh, food down to 250, and that's why he did that. What he did, and uh, he went and kickstarted the project. And I think he's like, you know, he's very the well things you do at Singularity is not just to go and make money into technology, right? It is actually uh, why are we doing it? So we had people like this guy, right, uh, Evan Wadongo. He was a CNN hero of 2010. You can't see it here, but his lungs is very thick. It's almost legally blind because uh, he is a Kenyan engineer from Nairobi. When he grew up in Kenya, he actually studied using kerosene lamp. If you know anything about kerosene lamp, the fuels are very toxic to your lungs and to your eyes. 
So he's almost legally blind. So when he became an engineer, he wanted to find a way to help his people. So he created this project called Just One Lamp, a solar lamp that you can actually charge during the day at some of five bucks. And you can be, then use it at night to read from. Uh, things as a result. So that's, that's why we do what we do, right? In terms of uh, why we pursue some of the, the, the uh, And Steve who's sitting behind me in, my, in the class, that's Steve Wozniak. Yeah, so, yeah, Steve's a really interesting guy. I mean, you know, he also talks about, you know, like, I think two things people should learn, right? They should learn coding and they should learn entrepreneurship. But he says that, you know, you don't actually need, not everybody likes coding, but you should learn coding, uh, at least from the age of 12 hours, so that you have a logical um, way of so solving. One of the things, robots are going to take away jobs, but it's, it's jobs that are drudgery, right? I mean, they have robots that will take away big pens and um, sh change sheets so nurses can be freed up to do more important things of taking care of people. Um, this is the thing, people think, oh, robots are going to take away all the jobs, we're all going to be unemployed. That is true, right? But then the same thing was true um, in, at the turn of the 20th century, right? 50% of the population in America was in agriculture. Today it's 2.8%. But do you have a 48% unemployment rate? No. People move on, right? They found new jobs. I mean, I can't even tell you right now what's going to happen. I mean, the iPhone is, what, seven years old? The iPad is like four years old? I mean, if you ask me like four or five years ago, what, what should my kids study? I, I couldn't tell you about an iOS. <laughs> I wouldn't have foreseen it. But this is what's going to happen. So what's going to happen is humans are going to be working with robots to be more productive, rather than robots themselves. So in the same token, what you need to look at is how robots be working with humans to do better stuff. Uh, they give an example actually at a Singularity broadcast uh, just yesterday um, about how, you know, you know how like um, Deep Blue defeated the Grandmaster, right, in chess. But did you know that they tried an, another experiment? They had the chess player, an amateur chess player working with a computer algorithm <coughs> and they defeated the Grandmaster. So technology is enabling us to do things that we never thought we could do by ourselves. Okay, let me give some examples. So the other area of robotics, for example, this is, uh, this is uh, basically uh, the Da Vinci robot. You sit down here and you can do an operation remotely. Uh, right now it's on optical fiber um, until the internet is super stable because obviously you, know, you don't want to be moving your appendix and then you know, the internet goes down. <laughs> um, and essentially, what, what was really interesting was the uh, inventor of this product, uh, Dr. Catherine Moore, she told me that you don't actually need to be a doctor to perform this operation. Just as long as you've got a pair of good hands. So if your kids love to play video games, let them play. 